everybody, I'm Catherine with Free Tours by Foot. Free Tours by Foot is a walking tour company that offers pay what you wish walking tours in cities all over the world. We also have self-guided tours, audio tours, and now virtual tours. So today I'm going to be taking you through the lower part of Central Park. We're right here at the southeast entrance to Central Park, Grand Army Plaza. So from here, we're gonna explore the pond and Gapstow Bridge before moving on through Central Park Zoo. We'll pick back up at the Woolman Skating Rink and visit the old Kinderberg area of the park. Then we'll take a stroll down the mall, Central Park's promenade, and meet some of the famed literary greats whose statues line the literary walk. Next, we'll visit the Bethesda Arcade and Terrace with arguably the park's most recognizable image, the Angel of Bethesda Fountain, before making a quick stop in Strawberry Fields, the memorial to John Lennon. And finally, we'll take a stroll through the Ramble, the park's wild side, and end at the Belvedere Castle with beautiful views of the northern half of the park. This tour is an abridged version of our live guided and audio tour, so we hope this will entice you to let us show you around when you come to visit New York City. So Grand Army Plaza was commissioned and created uh, in honor of Grand Army of the Potomac, one of the Union forces during the American Civil War. So that is where the Plaza Hotel, the world famous Plaza Hotel, gets its name because it is situated here on Grand Army Plaza. Across the street from the Plaza Hotel, you can see the fountain. Um, that's called the Pulitzer Fountain. It was paid for by Joseph Pulitzer. Um, so here in Grand Army Plaza as well, we have this gilded statue, and this is of General William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, he was a general for the Union side during the American Civil War. So why a statue of General Sherman, of all of the generals involved in the American Civil War? Well, after the war was over, General Sherman moved here to New York City and he was known for taking a daily horse and carriage ride in Central Park. So in the early 1900s, they decided to commission and have a statue in honor of him right here by the entrance of the park that he loved. So today we're only doing the lower section of Central Park, not all of Central Park. And the reason for that is that would take way too long. Central Park is 843 acres total. So that's 59th Street there at the south end of the park, goes all the way up to 110th Street in between Fifth Avenue and Central Park West, which would be 8th Avenue. So pretty big place. Um, but Central Park wasn't originally a part of the design of Manhattan, which was laid out in 1811. Um, the idea for needing a big public park, a green space for people in the city, didn't come about till later on, but the city had grown really, really quickly. The population had actually quadrupled in just 40 years. And so people really did need a nice, quiet, green place to escape the crowding and the hustle and bustle of the city um, and actually because there wasn't anything like Central Park a lot of people would go on their day off and have a picnic in a cemetery which I know by modern standards sounds incredibly weird and creepy but it was common at the time um, so the city decided it was time to have a large public place uh, for residents to come and relax and enjoy the sun and the green. And so they held a design competition um, and they, out of 33 designs, selected what was called the Greensward Plan. And that was done by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox. So the general idea behind the plan, the idea behind Central Park and what it looks like, is this was supposed to look really natural. Like this was just all here and they carved some little pathways through it. That said, uh, this has nothing to do with what the actual natural landscape in this area was. And it caused some problems because what was actually naturally occurring in this area was a very, very dense kind of granite called Manhattan schist. Um, we're going to see some schist just up here in a minute. Um, in order to even start construction on this place, they had to come in with gunpowder and start blasting apart all of this very dense rock so that they could clear it out and create Central Park. 
They used more gunpowder to build this place than they used during the Battle of Gettysburg in the American Civil War. Uh, they also realized that the topsoil here wasn't any good for growing anything. <laughs> so they had to remove the topsoil. Uh, they took different soil from New Jersey, came and spread it out here. They had to bring in millions of sapling trees, all to start work on our very natural looking park. So this is just right up here. All of these rocky outcroppings that you'll see all through Central Park, they did leave some of it in place, but this was largely what was here and what was naturally occurring. Um, so even though, yes, the design of this place does look incredibly natural, mostly everything is actually man-made and landscaped, um, including the bodies of water. So right over here, this is called the pond. We have the pond, we have the lake, we have some little creeks and streams that go through. These are all man-made and these all run right off of the city water supply system for New York. In fact, in some parts of the park uh, where you do have little creeks or streams that run through, those can be turned on and off like a faucet. So don't let the appearance of the place fool you. Um, we're gonna be coming up here to one of the most popular bridges in Central Park. We have over 50 bridges in this park and they're all unique, not a repeated design among them. But one of the most popular is called the Gafstow Bridge. Um, it's actually made of that Manhattan schist, um, some of that naturally occurring granite. So it's a really beautiful rustic look. But I think it's actually really popular because it provides one of the very best skyline views um, looking down into Midtown Manhattan. So I think that's really a large part of its appeal. It's also a very popular spot for wedding proposals because it's very romantic. Um, so we're going up on it here. So you can see the Gafstow Bridge here. You can see that arch, that beautiful arch made out of schist. Not actually the first bridge that was here. There was an earlier bridge that had been put into place. Unfortunately, it proved to be very delicate. It was made of cast iron and wood, and it really just couldn't withstand the elements here in Central Park. So this one was put in in the late 1800s. Um, but Central Park total was built from the 1850s until 1876. It took about 20 years to finish, but there were certainly some changes and alterations that had to happen after 1876 to create the park that we have today. So we're coming up here, uh, right up to the Gapstow Bridge, and we'll look out over that beautiful skyline. Okay, come on. Ta-da! <laughs> so you can see the Plaza Hotel, you can see some of Midtown Manhattan, some of these massive, tall apartment buildings. We call this Billionaire's Row. Um, so, and you can look out over the pond here. So right back here, pretty easy to miss. This little jutting peninsula is only four acres, but that's called the Hallett Nature Sanctuary. Um, and it is exactly what it sounds like. It's a wildlife sanctuary. But the really cool thing about it is it was only kind of recently reopened to the public. This was closed off to everybody in New York for over 80 years, and they've just started allowing people back in. So it's a really unique experience to go in there and see something in Manhattan that has been pretty untouched by people for that long. So it is open daily. They do regulate people coming in and out when you're allowed to go in, how many people can go in, but it is worth checking out. So we're here at the entrance to the Central Park Zoo. So I had talked to you about the Greensward plan, the design of Central Park that Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Vox came up with. Um, as popular as the Central Park Zoo is today, this, not a part of the Greensward plan. <laughs> this is absolutely not the intention for this area. But New Yorkers really, really wanted a zoo and people started coming here to the park site and dropping off gifts of animals like swans, bears. Uh, so they did start building some enclosures, you know, so they wouldn't have bears running around while they were trying to build. And they eventually decided to make it official. And that's why we got the Central Park Zoo. But this was only the second public zoo in the United States. The first one was Philadelphia. So the zoo that you see today walking around doesn't look very much like the original Central Park Zoo. Uh, there have been a lot of changes over the years, a few different iterations of the Central Park Zoo. but 
there are still some features that would have been here um, either when Central Park first opened or in some earlier versions of the zoo. And one of them is this building right up here. So this is called the Arsenal Building. This is actually one of few buildings that predate Central Park being in this area. It's called the Arsenal because it was an arsenal. <laughs> this is for the National Guard of New York. Um, wasn't a great location for them anymore once there was a public park in the area. So they left the building behind and it's had several purposes over the years. This was actually the very first American Museum of Natural History, the precursor to the much, much larger museum over on the west side of the park. Today, this is the headquarters of the Parks Department. Um, one of the other things that is older, not an original part, but right back here. This is the sea lion pool. And this was actually put in in the 1930s, so it is an older part of Central Park. You know, just trying to Maybe by out. modern standards it doesn't look so impressive, but it was considered really groundbreaking at the time because the person who designed it actually went and studied the natural habitat of sea lions and tried to recreate parts of that here in the zoo pool. And I, again, I know that doesn't sound impressive to anybody today. Oh, look, you can see them swimming and on the rocks. Um, but that was one of the, the first times somebody had actually said, hey, if we're going to keep animals in captivity, maybe we should make it nice for them. Um, but this pool is one of the most popular parts of the Central Park Zoo, especially if you can come here in the late morning. That's when they feed the sea lions and they get very excited and they sit on the rocks and they bark their heads off and it's really, really fun. So straight up here is the Delacorte clock. Now, if you've ever seen the animated film Madagascar, you have seen an animated version of this clock. Um, so every half hour, when the clock chimes go off, the little animals on the base go around in a circle and it plays music. It does play 44 different songs so that the people working here don't have to listen to the same thing over and over and over and over again, which I'm sure they appreciate. Um, this was donated by the Delacorte family. It's a name you're going to hear a lot in Central Park because they donated some other things that we're going to see later on. here in front of the Woolman Rink. The Woolman Rink is actually one of two ice skating rinks that we have here in Central Park. You have the Woolman Rink down here at the south end of the park and then the Lasker Rink which is all the way at the north end of the park. Of the two this is definitely the more uh, well-known, uh, the most recognizable. So this one was installed in 1950, actually all the way up until 1950. If you wanted to ice skate in Central Park, you didn't have man-made ice rinks. You waited for the pond or the lake to freeze over and for the ice to get solid enough to go skating. But fortunately, the Woolman family donated the funds to construct this so there would be a permanent ice rink here. It is opened usually from late October um, through the late spring here. Um, and it's also this particular ice rink has been seen in lots of different movies, including Home Alone 2 and Serendipity. So we're walking north now. We're heading up into what used to be called the Children's District. So the Children's District of Central Park included any of the sites that were really specifically geared towards children and their caretakers. One of them when the park was opened was up on this little mount up here. This was the site of what was called the Kinderberg or the Children's Mountain. It had a big shady pavilion up here on this hill so that children could rest. Um, today, instead of the Kinderberg, we have the Chess and Checkers House, which is this little octagonal building up here. Uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. You can play chess or checkers up here. They have outdoor tables underneath their beautiful arbors. You can actually borrow chess boards or checker boards from the parks department here. Um, and it is a really fun spot. The cornerstone of the original children's district when the park opened up was called the dairy. And the dairy was a little cottage looking building. It is covered with scaffolding right now. Um, but it's getting some much needed TLC. The dairy was one of the first buildings constructed here in this area. And it was called that because it was a dairy. <laughs> um, there were actually cows here on site in Central Park. Um, caretakers could take children here to get them some fresh milk. In the summer, they had ice cream. 
Um, despite the name the dairy sticking around until today, it hasn't functioned as a dairy in a very long time. It was used for a lot of other things, including a beer hall and a restaurant. Um, when the Central Park Conservancy, a private nonprofit, took over in the 1980s, this was the first building they renovated, and it's the visitor center. are here at the start of what's called the mall. So this is the only formal promenade in all of Central Park. It is only also the only pathway that makes a straight line. I don't know if you've noticed this already, but most of the sidewalks have been dipping and weaving and winding. That was completely on purpose. The whole idea of Central Park was to be an escape from the city. People feeling like they could get lost in nature. Now, the reason there is an exception here and there is this one straight line um, is this straight line leads up to Bethesda Terrace, which the designers considered the heart of Central Park. So this was like the slow, dramatic buildup as you got to that section. Um, people also refer to this area as the literary walk. So the reason they do is because we have statues right along this stretch of great literary figures. The first one here is William Shakespeare. But as we go up the rest of the mall or the literary walk, you will see um, other great poets and writers. Um, we'll show you a couple up here in just a second. Um, so the other unique thing about this area besides the literary statues is this beautiful canopy of trees. You've probably seen this somewhere before, even if you've never been to Central Park. This is one of the most filmed and photographed parts of the entire park. These trees on either side are American elm trees. They're extremely rare these days. Most elm trees in the United States were killed by Dutch elm disease. So these trees are very carefully protected and preserved so that we're able to hang on to them. So right over here, to continue our literary walk, we have Robert Burns. Over on this side, we have Walter Scott. Um, so continuing up this area, um, just so you know, some other stuff that's really close by to this section of Central Park. We're just on the east side of the Sheep's Meadow. The Sheep's Meadow is a big open green grassy space just behind me over here. Um, it's called the Sheep's Meadow because when Central Park first opened up, it was used for grazing sheep. I know it's really strange to think about sheep in the middle of Manhattan, but they actually grazed sheep there until the 1930s. Um, and when the sheep were taken away during the Great Depression, there was a little building just on the edge of the sheep meadow, and that was the sheepfold or the barn. And that became Tavern on the Green, one of the most famous restaurants in New York City. Um, also in this area, you have the statue of Balto. Uh, Balto is a Siberian husky. Uh, and it's actually supposed to be representing about 150 dogs that did something called the Great Serum Run, um, which is when uh, teams of sled dogs and their mushers relayed diphtheria antitoxin to Nome, Alaska to save that town from an epidemic. So right here, not a literary statue, but our newest addition. This is the Women's Rights Pioneers Monument. This was just put into place in August of 2020 for the centennial anniversary of the Women's Voting Amendment. Um, so here in this sculpture, you have Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Sojourner Truth, three women who fought tirelessly for women's rights to vote in this country. Um, none of these three women actually lived to see women get that right, but they were pioneers and they were absolutely instrumental in laying the groundwork for millions and millions of women to have rights later on. All right, we are heading out to the Bethesda Terrace, the heart of Central Park, according to the designers. So we have Bethesda Terrace, Bethesda Arcade, and Bethesda Fountain in this area. Uh, the meaning behind the use of the word Bethesda, it's actually a biblical reference. Uh, it's from the New Testament, from the Gospel of John. There is supposed to be a pool called Bethesda with miraculous healing water. So what does any of that have to do with New York City? Um, in 1842, New York City built something called the Croton Aqueduct. And that was a means of transporting fresh water from about 40 miles upstate into New York City. I know it doesn't sound like that big of a deal today. It's, it's just water, but it was a huge turning point for New York City. 
Before that, New York had a lot of massive destructive fires. Um, we burned down huge parts of the city and have to start over again. And we also had a lot of sickness, yellow fever, cholera, waterborne diseases because people were drinking dirty water. So when we had this fresh water coming in, it really was like a rebirth for New York City. It was a really big deal, enough to inspire um, all of this. Uh, so this is the Bethesda Arcade, this gorgeous tile work ceiling up here. Um, I know it looks absolutely pristine, like we have just taken perfect care of it since the 19th century. That is not true. <laughs> um, this was actually pretty recently renovated and they were able to do that because the Minton Tile Company in England who had manufactured the original ceiling tiles was still in operation. And so they were able to have them replicated so that the entire ceiling could be restored. So stepping out here, out onto the terrace. So this is the Bethesda Terrace and straight ahead is Bethesda Fountain. Um, so the name of the fountain is Bethesda Fountain, but the sculpture on top of the fountain is called the Angel of the Waters. Um, so the Angel of the Waters sculpture was designed by a woman named Ebba Stebbins. She was, it was the first public art commission for a woman in New York City, which in the mid 1800s was a really big deal. Um, so the statue, like everything else, is meant to commemorate this water being brought into New York City. The angel has her hand out. She has a lily in her other hand. The lily represents purity, so the purity of the water. She has her hand out blessing the pool. The picture is a little incomplete in the winter time because the water's not running. <laughs> Normally she actually has, you know, water under her hand. So just picture it. Um, this is actually one of, uh, again, a very filmed photographed area, much like the mall is. So you have probably seen this in films or in TV shows. So up here, at the edge of the Bethesda Terrace, you have the lake, one of our bodies of water. We have a pond and we have a lake. Um, it looks smallish, this section right here, but it opens way out when you get a little bit further west. So it's actually pretty sizable. This was one of the really popular spots for ice skating in New York City before we had the Woolman Rink or the Lasker Rink. The building just across the way is called the Boathouse. The Boathouse is a restaurant, uh, but the name is because originally there was a boathouse there. That's where you rented those rowboats that you see sometimes maybe in movies, uh, people rowing. You can still rent rowboats. They just don't come from the boathouse anymore. Now it's a restaurant. A really nice place to eat if you want beautiful views of Central Park. And just across the way is the Ramble, which we'll see a little bit of later on. now entering in one of the relatively newer sections to be added to the park. Um, this is called Strawberry Fields. This was not added to Central Park until the 1980s. So relative to the rest of the park, it is a little more recent. Um, this was done in honor of John Lennon, a uh, former Beatles member and world famous solo artist as well. And the reason this particular section of the park was chosen was that he lived just outside um, of the park here at 72nd and Central Park West at the Dakota Building, which we'll see in a little bit. Um, this part of the park was commemorated in the 1980s and dedicated to him after he was killed in front of the Dakota building. Um, a lot of different people came together to work on this, but also it was endorsed as what was called a garden of peace by all of the countries listed on this plaque. And it says, imagine all the people living life in peace. Um, so one of the most famous things to come and see at Strawberry Fields is what we call the Imagine Mosaic. Um, this mosaic was done by Italian craftsmen. It was a gift from the city of Naples. Um, and it just very simply says the word imagine in the middle. Um, that was one of John Lennon's most famous songs. Um, the name Strawberry Fields does not reference strawberry plants anywhere in here. That's the Beatles song, Strawberry Fields Forever. This is a big gathering spot all the time, but specifically on John Lennon's birthday and also on the anniversary of his death. A lot of people gather here and always a place to come and hear some live music. And it is a must get photo for a lot of tourists in New York City to come right here to the Imagine Circle. So 
So I had mentioned that John Lennon lived at the Dakota building, which is right outside. It's this building straight up ahead with the peaked roofs. Um, so it was famous, of course, in that time because John Lennon lived there, but actually it had been home to a number of celebrities beforehand. And before that, on its own, was one of the best known apartment buildings in New York City. It was actually considered one of the first luxury apartment buildings in New York City. Uh, most New Yorkers live in apartments now, but when this was built in the 1880s, that really wasn't true. Wealthy people lived in large townhouses, not in apartments. So this was a very new idea here at the Dakota. Um, not only was the idea of a luxury apartment kind of new and crazy to people, um, a lot of people thought the location of this building was absolutely terrible. That's actually where the name, the Dakota, comes from. The running joke between the owner of the building and his friends was that if his building was any further north and any further west of New York City, it may as well be in the Dakota territories or where North and South Dakota are today. Um, I think it worked out for him. The building became famous um, and that's where the name comes from. Right back here is Bow Bridge. This is the longest of all of the bridges in Central Park. It's a beautiful arched cast iron bridge. Um, definitely one of the most popular ones for people to walk across. You can also see a little bit more of the lake back here. I had mentioned back at Bethesda Terrace that the lake is quite a bit bigger than it looks just from Bethesda. So you can see, see a little bit more of it here. Um, just across Bow Bridge on the other side is the Ramble and that's going to be our very next stop. So we are now in the Ramble. So this part of the park, I think, is one of the most peaceful parts of Central Park. The whole idea behind this section is it's meant to feel like you are in a wild, natural forest. Now that said, this is Central Park, so it's not wild and natural. It is man-made and landscaped to look like it's a wild, natural forest. Um, so this part of the park is a really good escape from Manhattan. You can't really see the buildings around you anymore, can't hear the traffic noise. It is also one of the best spots in the United States for bird watching. Over 230 different species of birds have been spotted here in the Ramble. So walking through, you often see bird watchers out with binoculars and notebooks. Um, so if you've ever wanted to give bird watching a try on your next trip to New York City, you can come to the Ramble. edge of the ramble you have this little stone building up ahead this is Belvedere Castle um, so we're gonna head up here because you have an absolutely amazing view from the terrace of this little castle um, it might look strange or sound strange that there is a tiny little fairy tale looking castle in the middle of Central Park um, but this was designed in the 1870s by Calvert Vox one of the two creators of Central Park um, so in architectural terms, this is what's known as a folly, which is just a fancy way of saying a building that serves no practical purpose whatsoever. It was only there to look pretty. <laughs> but it was in a good location because originally when Central Park opened up, just north of this castle, there was a giant reservoir. And so that was the receiving reservoir for the Croton Aqueduct system. Um, so this is the highest point here in Central Park. And so this little castle looked out over the reservoir and the water. This was a really popular spot for people to come. So Belvedere means beautiful view in Italian. And you'll see why in just a minute, because it is absolutely gorgeous up here. So even though this is not supposed to serve any practical purpose, it ended up serving a really practical purpose. Um, in around the turn of the 20th century, the National Weather Service decided that this was the perfect place to take weather readings for New York City. Uh, and so they moved into this little castle. So historically, if you ever heard a weather report saying, you know, it's 72 degrees and sunny in Central Park, that's what they meant. <laughs> it was, it's 72 degrees and sunny at Belvedere Castle. Um, so we can come up here and take in some of the views 
So you can really, because it's so high up here, um, there's no reservoir that you look out over anymore, but there's quite a bit um, besides that now. So right over here, you can see these green seats. Um, that's an amphitheater. That's called the Delacorte Theater. That's where Shakespeare in the Park is performed every summer. So next time you're in New York City in the summer, you want to see some world-class Shakespeare for free, <laughs> go to the Delacorte Theater. Um, just beyond that, that stretch of green lawn that you can see the beginning of, that's the Great Lawn. Um, great place to go have a picnic, lay in the sun. You'll see some baseball diamonds on the Great Lawn. Also a very popular spot for concerts. The New York Philharmonic plays a free summer concert there on the Great Lawn every year. Um, on that side of the park, just on the east edge of the park, is the Pet Metropolitan Museum of Art. On the west side of the park, just opposite, is the American Museum of Natural History. Um, so really you're right in the center of a lot to do and see in Central Park. And let's come right over here and just take in the view from this corner, because I think this is the best corner. <laughs> you can just see everything. Um, so the water down there is actually what is left of the reservoir. When the reservoir was no longer needed, when the water distribution system had changed a little bit, they filled in most of the reservoir. That's where the Great Lawn is today. But they decided to keep just this little strip of it, and that is now called Turtle Pond. It's called Turtle Pond because there are many, many, many turtles in it. Um, if you wanted to see some turtles in Central Park, that is where you would look. Um, but you can see the castle a little bit better from here as well. There are actually two castle platforms. Um, the castle's not open today, but normally you are able to go up even higher onto those castle platforms and you can really see out over a good amount of Central Park. All right, this is where we are going to finish up. So thank you so much for joining me today. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and ring that bell so that you can get a notification every time we have new content coming out. If you would like to leave a tip for your guide, that would be so very much appreciated. Uh, PayPal and Venmo information will be included. Um, thank you all so much for coming and we hope we see you next time.